start at 255, right? Give people a little bit of extra time. <laughs> I hear everyone talking about the sessions and stuff, so I didn't want to really interrupt. I just use it. <laughs> listening. But uh, my name is Derek Rickard. Um, this is a presentation on DAX filters. Uh, I am I'm a consultant. I've been in Bellingham, Washington. Over here. Hey, there's more people. Do I want to wait? Hi. Um, I live in Bellingham, Washington, so I drove down here, uh, and I uh, thought it'd be cool to present this single Saturday. Um, we presented this at the, the Bellingham Power BI user group just uh, a couple weeks ago, and I'll say that it's it's I think it works better if we ask questions and have dialogue during. So please don't hesitate to ask questions and interrupt and that kind of thing. I listed this as an intermediate session because um, really the, most of the concepts are, are, are very straightforward when we're talking about just filters and kind of how, how you understand filters. It's when you get into how DAX plays with those filters that it can get a little bit more complex. So, and that's where I think the, 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 you know, the questions um, in the middle of the session are, are welcome. And I think you won't be the only, only one of those questions if you have them. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming. I think this is the last slot of the day, right? So thanks for sticking around for the whole day. Um, first things first, we have a thank you to our sponsors for SQL Saturday. Um, so you guys have seen the slide, I don't know how many times today, so here it is again. It's necessary, right? Uh, so thank you to them. And here's kind of an overview of our session. I didn't make things soberly complex. I just wanted to you know, have plenty of time to talk, talk and uh, do some demos. So the overview is uh, what are filters? So we could be, um, we'll be talking about filter context and row context, and some of you guys maybe already know what that is, and some of you don't. And um, also uh, how relationships um, affect filters, and how reports can affect filters, and how data modeling can, and finally how can filters be modified, which is what we're going to get into DAX, the DAX formula. So first things first, what are filters? Um, so I wrote this definition here, I usually don't like to have a lot of words on my slides, but at the same time, if I was going to share this, which I, which I will, um, we want the full definition. So filters are tools used to bring meaningful context to data and can be utilized while consuming reports as well as authoring reports in data model. So that seems like a lot of stuff, and it also seems kind of vague. And that's totally on purpose because uh, filters really do run, I mean, they, they can be seen from any, any part of the reporting process, you know, especially in the Power BI um, slash analysis services tabular offering. Um, so uh, that's kind of what I have as a definition for filters. Um, so where do filters present themselves? So one place where they present themselves is just in the report report area, the report canvas. So even if you're a consumer of the report, you, you interact with filters by interacting with slicers on the page, by looking at page filters and report filters, just even columns and rows of pivot tables, um, all of those act as filters because you're taking whatever measure is in there and then you're filtering it based on those labels. Same with the data fields and visualizations. All those things are examples of filters after your data. Um, and so I put a little note here that this is kind of filter context at play. So when you're in the, when you're looking at a report or a pivot table or something like that, it's, it's interacting with the data model. All those things that you're bringing in are just examples of filter context, which is slightly different than what we could run into when we're actually offering this in the data model, where it can analysis services tabular, um, meant, uh, in analysis services tabular or in the data modeling um, environments like in Power BI or Power Pivot. Those are going to be a little bit different. So even beyond understanding that a row label is a filter, you also have relationships that act as filters. So that's part of it in the data model. As an author, creating relationships will have filter implications. <coughs> Tables have filters that can apply when you, um, when you add a calculated column. There's a row context. And then there's calculated columns and calculated measures. All of those things can affect, can affect filters. Uh, so note, well, actually note on the bottom here, Filter context and row context is at play. What this kind of means is that if you're authoring um, in a data model, then you really have to think about row context. As a report consumer, you don't really have to think about that. Filters are just acting as filters, and it's kind of, uh, it's just intuitive in terms of I'm bringing in categories, and I have my 10 categories, and it's taking my data and separating it out into those 10 categories. That's all filters. As an author, you just have to give a little bit more thought into row context and how that can um, mess with your data. So for that, I have a whole slide on what is row context. Um, it's a, a filter applied by the existence of a row typically in a table. So in Excel, this is really 
very easily understood. I mean, if you're in Excel and you want to add a column to the end of a, of a row, you can just say, I'm going to equal this cell plus this cell or whatever sort of formula you want to have on there. And it kind of understands, I mean, it does understand where you're living in. If you're in a row, and it calculates it for that row. In the data model situation, it can be different. Um, some DAX functions ignore row context, and I'll have a little example of that later. So that means it doesn't know that it's in a row, and it doesn't really, it doesn't necessarily behave how you think it would behave. And then some DAX functions actually create a new row context. So something that you don't see in a table, maybe it's just a calculated measure you're creating, um, but it can, in the background or in, um, in memory, create a table, and it creates that, by creating that table, it creates a row context. So again, something that you have to think about as a, as a report author, um, but not necessarily as a report consumer. So how do filters behave? So this is where I'm going to get into some demos. So um, really, these are simple demos. This is kind of like what I was saying. This is still really baseline, not even the intermediate portion of this, but, um, but we'll get into that. So I have two screens here, so let's do this. I haven't zoomed in a lot, too. So we have a simple example for um, you know an adventure works type thing, but I added rickshaws. Um, so I have, as an example here, we have a pivot table where I just brought in the quantity, the sum of quantity, right? For, for classic um, filter context, this is how we would see it as a report consumer. I could bring a product category and I can see that, there we go, we have bikes, boats, and rickshaws, and our sum of quantity is, is acting on those things, right? I mean, the bikes are 19,000, boats are 9,000, and so on. Each of those things are actually a filter to the quantity. That's how they're acting. This is a filter, it's an example of filter context. As would be any of these other fields if I brought them in, for example, month. Now right here, this is actually, there's actually two filters acting on this. The filter of likes and the filter of January. So all this stuff is, like I said, this could be something you've seen before and it's pretty straightforward. Um, or it could be something that you haven't quite looked at it in this way, but that's, that's really what's going on there. Another example would be, maybe I'll bring in price. Put that up here and just like all the products that cost eleven forty one in the bikes area. So really now this is actually, this is now three filters I think on this. We have the price of eleven forty one, we have a month of January and um, the category of bikes. So all of these can be seen as just different filters acting on a single measure, which is the sum of quantity. Right? That's our simple demo of of filter content. Um, for Relationships. I'm going to go to the data model here. This um, example of where we have boats, bikes, and rickshaws. This is actually a good example of how relationships, um, how filters act across relationships. So I'm going to look at the data model here. Sorry, I'm going to the and the diagram view, and you can see that this has several tables in there. Not many. We have a sales table that has just the IDs, product ID, customer ID, date, quantity, right? You can ignore these measures for now. In fact, I'll just, uh, um, so we have those four things there. And then in this table, we have our customer ID with a discount. We have a product table that has our product attributes and so on. When I brought over category in here, the category actually filtered the quantity. That category exists in the product table, and by doing nothing more than creating a relationship between these two tables on product ID, it was able to filter quantity in a fully separate table. Again, this is not this is not profound. This is not new. It's more just understanding that that a filter will act across a relationship. So, as a question, yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I've always heard. Yeah. Never filter the fact table. Filter the dimension that the fact table is connected to, and I've always wondered why. Um, I think, the, I think the reason why someone would say never would be um, you can run into performance issues if you're doing a lot of filtering on the fact table. Um, I don't actually say never on that because you can have a performance measure that would act across millions of rows of data um, because of how this information is stored in the data model. Um, without getting too far into it, you can imagine if I, if I only have 10 products, as an example, if I only have 10 products and I want to filter that to a single product or whatever, I can choose to filter, let's say the sales table is 50 million rows. 
I can choose to filter that table by saying filter sales to this, right? Um, when I say filter sales, the sales table, it's actually looking at every single column. Like it's going to look at all the columns because I didn't say I just want the product ID, I just want. It. In my case, I just said filter sales. Right? But if I said it a little bit differently and I said filter sales product ID, it, because of how this stuff is stored in the background, it's all columnar storage, right? It will only see that, well, sales product ID, there's only 10 things there. And filtering that isn't too hard to do. You see what I'm saying? So, so they probably say that just because it's better practice to do. To, to do that, you'll run into less performance issues. Um, because if I, if I were just to stick to filtering the whole table at once, filtering sales would take a lot longer than filtering products. There's only 10 products, right? Mm -hmm. But if you get a little bit uh, more deliberate about, about little yeah, if you get a little bit more deliberate about what columns you're actually filtering instead of just saying filtering a whole table, right. then you actually will you'll run into you know, it just as performant um, as, as going to the dimension table. Does that make sense? Does that yeah. kind of answer that question? Yeah, that's good. Feel free to, you know, like I said, interrupt, and it could be slightly related to this or not. It, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, again, that's the really, that's how a relationship, a filter can traverse a relationship. The last one I have here is um, is row context. This my my slide went off the back there, but that's fine. So row context, an example of that would be here. I have this really simple table, although it doesn't. I'm not saying it makes a lot of sense. This table. But you can imagine that I just said, hey guys, <coughs> just tell me what kind of pet you have and what their age is, okay? That's what we have here. This is not how a normal database would store this stuff. It's just me collecting information from you. And it just happens to be that two people in the room said cat, and they happen to also be the age of three, right? So there's, there's, it looks like there's a duplicate row there, but it's really because two people said. Ideally, you would have a person ID and stuff, but don't worry about that stuff. It's just for example. So I have that here um, to show what row context what a row context is, I'm going to go into the data model again. And this is the same table, right? I just sucked that into the, into the data model. And if I add a calculated column, that this was the same as the age column, I get there. See? Oh, it's the same exact thing as the column next to it. So that's because it knows when I say, OK, it equals to the age column. It knows what row it's in. And it just says, OK, that's, that's going to be that, that column in this row, that's a three. That's a really simple example of, of just this being aware that there is a row in place. And in a minute, I'll show an example of why this becomes confusing when you're writing down some row. Okay? But that's just what row context is. There, there exists a row, and I understand what, what it's trying to do. One thing that you can't do uh, with row context is traverse relationships. So if you have, um, if you want, if you're in the fact table of that other one, if you're in here and you want to add product category, for example, to this sales table, you couldn't just say equals the product category. Not without saying something explicit about this lives in a different table. So um, yeah, there, there are functions for that. But I'm just saying you can't just say equals product category and it knows what you're talking about. Um, so that's the really simple examples of just how filter context displays itself, how relationships can, can affect filters and how real context presents itself. Haven't really got into the, the, the heavy lifting on any of that. So, yeah, simple demo. All right, so this is just talking a little bit more about you know, the relationships. And, yeah, filters traverse relationships automatically. Real context does not traverse relationships without explicit function calls. So related or related table would be what you'd use to grab information from another table. If you're in a fact table and you want to grab a single, single piece of information from a dimension table, you would use related. But if you're in a dimension table and you want to understand the information that's in a fact table, which would be more rows than it would be a one to many relationship, you would use related table to, to grab information. That's how you would get row context to kind of be forced across relationships. So before going into the next part, which is talking about the DAX and how to modify these things, are there any questions about just just kind of the normal behavior of, of filters. Okay. Just really trying to get that steady, <coughs> steady base so when we go to talk about this other stuff, um, at least we have an idea of the row context versus filter context and relationships. So. All right, so the next part is how can filters be modified? Um, so this is all through DAX. This is how we can modify filters. Um, 
what we'd normally see uh, when we bring over category, product category, is it would behave by the category names which filter the measure, just like bikes would filter the bikes and so on. Um, you can use DAX to override those filters, to override what is showing um, in whatever field you bring over. You just have to be deliberate about it. So the most common way of doing that is by using the calculated function. Um, I should probably ask this Paul the room. How many people here already use DAX? Well, that's a little. So, how many people in the room have used Calculate? Okay, a lot of people. Okay, cool. So, this, uh, this part is not going to be anything new here. I'm hoping that there'll be some other new stuff when we start talking about context transition. But, um, but yeah, so this is the most common way of doing it. You have an expression, and then you just have a filter that you apply to that expression. So, a lot of you have seen this, but here's a simple example of just the, the data set we're looking at. If I wanted to understand what um, the product sales were for bikes, the quantity for bikes alone, this is an example of writing out that function in DAX, just saying, I want to calculate the sum of quantity, and I want the filter to be on bikes. So now I'm just going to go to that as a demo. I'm going to go to that and, and do it. So I already have these functions written, but at the same time, I can write them from scratch, whatever we want to do. But um, right here, I'll just go. So here's exactly what I had on that other screen. So I have my bikes quantity. This is my simple example of bikes quantity. And I'm just calculating the sum of quantity where the category is bikes. So you can see, again, this is, this is looking at that sales table where quantity lives. And then we're using a, a category in a totally different table, filtering that category for bikes. And that filter, because there's a relationship, it, it applies to the so what that looks like is this, which is, you know, as expected, maybe as expected actually, I don't know if everyone would expect that it would be the same number for all three, but that's what's happening here. Um, there's a little bit of, by the way, I should probably say too that, that a lot of what I'm talking about here is, is kind of uh, just my takeaways from Marco Russo's book, um, and that's the big purple book on DAX, I don't know if you, anyone's read that. Raise anybody read that book? But this is just my takeaway on that. So um, if you want some really good reading, some really great page turning 500 pages of reading, um, <laughs> take, take that book. <laughs> um, so anyway, this, this here is, is what happens when you apply a really simple filter. And notice that although I filtered on bikes, it still shows the same number for boats and rickshaws, right? And that may not be expected. You may just think that it should show up on bikes and not show up on boats and rickshaws. Not to mention that the grand total also shows the, the, the bikes of the boat. This would be really nice if you needed to calculate something like percent share, right? Because you can see like, hey, your numerator is the sum of quantity and your denominator is the quantity of bikes. So if you wanted to know the percentage of bikes, I don't know why you would want to, but if you wanted to know that, you could easily do that as a, as a separate tax function. But, but yeah, so this may or may not be expected. And really what's going on here is that uh, there was a call made, like there was a call made by the team, by the Microsoft team or whoever, that said when someone applies a filter, to a category, and that category is shown up here, um, we're just gonna override the filter. We're not gonna add to the filter. So you can imagine if you're here and you added the filter of bikes, then this would be okay because it's already filtered on bikes. But if you're here and you add the category of bikes, adding the category of bikes, right? This should, this should go away, right? And so would this because these are on, this is rickshaw. So something can't be a rickshaw on a bike. So you expect that to kind of go away. But the call made for when you do a simple one is that we're going to remove any filters that are on that category, and then we're going to apply bikes to that. So that's what's happening in this one. So um, that may not be that may not be understood by looking at this syntax. So I want to show you guys an equivalent syntax that I mean it's exactly the same. The the, uh, the execution plan or the plan in the background is, is identical to this. And this one tells you a little bit more about why that same number is showing up over. This is what's really happening. So you have a sum of quantity, that's still our expression, there's no difference there. But really what's happening on the back end, this is with all this syntax there, is we're filtering just this column of that table. All product categories. That's actually what releases the filter on categories. So the very first step is doing is just taking off any filter that's there, and then it's reapplying a filter five category equal to bytes. So that's why the same thing shows up for every single line. Because the first thing it does is takes all, all five categories. So you can see if I added this guy, and please, uh, again, ask questions if, if this is not making sense or if you want to. 
When I add this guy, it's the same exact thing. And like I said, the execution plan is the same um, if you actually were to trace this. Um, it's the same exact thing. It's just the very first one is just an, a quick way of people for people to write it. I believe Marco Russo calls it syntax sugar. That's really what it is. It's just a sweet way of writing it real fast. And you're done with it. Um, if you wanted to actually apply the filter as an and instead of a instead of an override, if you wanted to say I want it to be whatever the filter context is, and I want it to be flex. It may not be easy to see what you do from our first example, but it might be easier to see from here. Because instead of, I know that I have to make this bigger so it's not. The reason why it's showing for every single one is because it's all right. So the way to get that to only show, that to make it an additional filter rather than override, is you have to change, you don't want to look at everything in the product category, you only want to look at what current values are present, right? Current filter one. Yeah, it's like a current filter, right? And this is kind of where I have a beef with the name for values, the values formula. That's really what values is saying. Values formula is just saying what is the what is the list of current things in this column, right? So if I were to, I know I'll just bring up the other one because I just don't want to mess these guys up. So the only difference here is that I change that all <coughs> to use values. So, if you can imagine what, if you, if you were to imagine I just had values of product category as my measure, what would show up is the very first line would show is bikes, because that's what the value is of that of the stuff in that category. The second one would show boats, the third one would show rickshaw, and the total would actually show three things. There would, have, there would be three things in there. It would show all three of those, those values, because that's what they are. It's three different product categories. So what this is saying is, is say, take, the, take the sales quantity, that's normal, we're going to filter all the current values to also add the filter of bike. So what that means is when we actually put this in our pivot here, and I'll just remove that first one since it's a good one anyway. So we can see it only adds the filter. It only shows bikes, right? And these guys don't show there. This, this could be a behavior that you want to see on your report for, or I should say, maybe this wouldn't be expected for whoever you're giving it to, so you'd rather see this. The other thing, too, is if I... If I were to remove this sum of quantity, this guy here, if you were just to show this by yourself, by itself, this may be confusing, right? Where this one would be more desirable. So just an example of like, here's how you can mess with the with the filter context and give you exactly what you want. Because if you then were to just bring over bikes quantity here, it would only show bikes cat. So um, that's Again, the most common, I'll go back to this. That's the most common way of using this, especially using this simple, you know, Boolean filter is saying category equals this or date equals this or whatever. That's very that's a very straightforward way of doing it. Um, but it does have that implication that you're going to first release the filter on whatever you're filtering on, and then apply apply bytes to it or whatever you're doing. Um, any questions on, on just that part? Still pretty simple, um, but I'll actually say getting the intermediate there. Especially understanding how how this translates to the filter function, filter all, and then, and then applying that to the movie. So the next portion is, oh, well, there's other ways of modifying the filter, not just using the filter function, which is right here, and calculate, calculate table, but all, there's a ton of things that will allow you to modify um, the filters. Uh, related table, or it's filtered. All these things can be used to, all these DAX functions can be used to do something similar. Notice all is in there as well. And values should be in there somewhere. Oh, we didn't actually make the cut. Oh, no, it's right there. There. Values in there too. But all these things, uh, when you apply them, they have some sort of filter effect. Um, so there's no, there's no lack of DAX in terms of if, if you want to get some sort of filter behavior out of a measure. You just have to kind of like go in and like right, find find what you what you're looking for. And one one um, yes. question. Yeah. If we go back to the previous slide where it showed value only for the bikes. Uh huh. Um, so in the result set which you showed, the grand total shows up, right? I thought it would show only for the bikes row, and the grand total would be empty. Right? Yeah, you think you know, think of and that's that's a good point because you're like, oh, maybe because the grand total is not just bikes, it wouldn't show that. All right. But think about. Think, yeah, think about what's happening on this guy. Um, 
This is a really good point because you wouldn't necessarily expect that. So what's happening here is it's saying, we have the sum quantity, we understand the expression. The filter is saying, take anything that is currently living in the products category table. So at the grand total, what are, what are, what are the list of categories? It's bikes, boats, and rickshaws. It's all three of them, right? It says then take that list and apply the bikes filter to it. So it does leave bikes there. Bikes is still present. And that's why you still get that 19,000 at the grand total. Does that kind of make sense? Because really it's, it's um, it's because this value implies what is the list of all things present in the category. And when you're at the grand total, the grand total is showing, the grand total is the list of all three. <clears throat> so if you have the list of three and then apply the bikes filter to that, then you get a list of one and the number back is there. Or maybe the other question is that yeah. um, if I want to show uh, the sum of all the three alone in the grand total, that's a different yeah, so you're saying like, um, if you wanted to, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. What's that? Wasn't that when you put all, and then you didn't put the rest of the, <coughs> can you calculate statement? When you put all in the calculate statement, that gave me the this guy here, you know, these two. Um, I think I got okay. Yeah, but are you saying you'd like, maybe you want to see the 49,000? Yes. yes. 49,000 in the total here, but 19,000 here? Uh, I understand it's, it cannot be in the same column. Yeah, yeah, and I think the reason why I wouldn't expect the 49 to be yes. here, I mean, it can be in the same boat. You can, you can make that happen, but there's just mm -hmm. some funniness to it because what would you call this measure then? Because yeah. it wouldn't be bikes quantity anymore because sometimes it's bikes quantity when you're on the bike, mm -hmm. but when you're at the grand total, it's not a bike quantity anymore. It's all of it. <coughs> so, so you would have to, you could do that if you're looking for that type of behavior. You would just have to make sure that your measure name reflects something that would make sense. Um, and really what you could do is you could just wrap another DAX statement around and say, if my values is bikes, calculate the sum of quantity. Okay. Otherwise, give the yeah, give the total. Right. Thank you. So in yes. a way, it's, uh, it seems to me that we're transposing the column into sorry, the row argument. You mean in terms of the in terms of how the measures are? <coughs> For this particular example. Yeah. Um, if you were to create three more columns, and then call the second one both, and the third one you're just both. Oh, yeah. And you're just transposing. Most definitely. And that's really, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that the measures themselves are that useful. <laughs> like, this this measure wouldn't necessarily be that useful, because you're right, you can just apply the row label as a filter, and you don't have to have a separate filter. But what I wanted to emphasize was how you could modify a filter. Um, and I wanted to keep that as simple as possible, because once you get down to, um, when you get to something that would be a little bit more useful, the, the, the baseline is, is more complex. So I didn't want that to create noise for what I'm trying to explain. But an example of that would be, let's say that these guys are all, all their products are parts of a department instead. And actually, we could, we could do that, because we could say product ID, and I think there's a lot of product IDs here. So let's say instead of, instead of talking about, um, and you can ignore all these other things here, because they're really, they don't really come to play but you could say, well, under bikes, I have four products. And I would like to know what percentage these products are of the total for that, for that category. What's, what is this as a percentage of bikes total? Right? So this is where you may want to calculate bikes, or actually just calculate whatever it is for, for the category. right? Um, and then you can do a percentage. I mean, that would, that would be something that's more useful, because then you want to understand what is, how is that single product playing into the quantity of, of the entire category. So if you did want to do a percentage by category in this case, mm -hmm. would you need to write a measure that one for bytes and a separate measure for votes? No, you could do it in No, one. you could do it in one. You would basically and, and then you filter on category. Yeah, yeah, filter yeah. on category. So you'd release the filter yeah. on yeah. products. Yeah. And then you'd reapply the filter category. Whatever the current filter would be. All, right? You would have to use all. Yeah, yeah. You'd use all in the products table. Because you have to do this two ways. You have to first release the filter. Because right here, right. calculate yeah. automatically reduces right. releases the filter. Yeah, doesn't it? It would release it on the only on the on the column that you're you're filtering. So if you can imagine here, we're we're here at five. And actually, we'll, we'll write out those decks so we can see this. But we're we're first going to wax philosophically about it, right? So we're here, um, and I say. 
So basically, this is saying, all right, first thing I did is I released any filters on products. And then I reapplied the filter only for the category, not for the products themselves. So this will give us our denominator of our ratio, right? So now the next step is just if we're creating a percentage, we would just do that divided by that. You see how, and I, I'll do that really quick just to, just to have this, some, some, yeah, to finish this example. I never realized values is so powerful. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Values is really cool. How and that's do I why do this? How do I do this? I never really liked the name of values. Sorry, I was drilling through. Never liked the name of values because it didn't really express what was going on, you know? Um, okay, I need to add it. All right, so this will be percent of category. Oops. Quantity. Category. So now I'll just do, I can just do a divide function. And the numerator is going to be uh, my sum of quantity, right? Yeah. So it's going to be my sum of quantity down there. And my denominator is going to be my, well, it's a horrible name because bikes quantity test is not a good name. It actually <laughs> should be quantity of category. It should be a better name, but it's okay. This is not something I'm actually delivering to anyone. <laughs> and I'll make it a percentage and I'll give it a, a single decimal point. Statement in column D to produce that percentage? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you could have it just be in one. Yeah, yeah, you could yeah, make that's it just what I one statement. Yeah, yeah. In and, the calculate <coughs> statement. Yeah, you could. Um, you, you basically, um, the calculate statement would be the denominator, right? Right. Okay. So our numerator would be the sum of quantity and our denominator would be that long calculate uh, expression. But yeah, you could definitely do it in one. In, in one um, desk. Okay. If you were doing that for a customer, what's your best practice on having an intermediary and a measure sitting there or not? I wouldn't do the intermediate, but if I did do the intermediate, um, I would hide it. Like this one, so if I were doing this for a customer, I would go and I wanted the intermediate for some reason, maybe it's just something that <coughs> I just needed. Um, I can go into my data model here and go to that that um, that table that, you, that has the test one, which is in here somewhere, it's by this one. There it is. I can just right click and hide that in the client where, tables. Where, where are you right now? Oh, I'm in, sorry, I'm in the data model. So I opened yeah. up Power Pivot. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I went to the table sales, which is where that, where I, where that measure lives. Oh, but then down at the bottom, because I haven't seen that UI in this Oh, yeah, yeah. So this, this down area down here is where you can write comments, but it's also where you can define measures. It's just another area where you can write measures. So notice when I clicked on there, my measure is just right up top. Is Power BI the same split? No, not quite. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on Power BI, you can do it right from the field list. And you can right click right on the field list and say hide from client tools. So that would be, if you wanted an intermediate one, you could you could just hide that and that would take care of that. And then the other She's question. Got oh, I'm going to get rid of that for you. Um, just one follow on. Yeah, yeah, follow on. The yeah. calculate that you did, that syntactic sugar that you talked about was the all right. You could remove that and it would still be the same. If you, if you replace it with the filter portion, yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, what's your best practice on if you always? I like I like to you know I even though that is syntax sugar it is way easier to read so I if I especially if I'm delivering this to a client I keep the easy to read ones available if there isn't any performance implication I'll leave it there for sure yes thank you for sharing this it's so useful and so let's say uh, if the user selects from the slicers if they filter some products uh, how does that affect the formula like if we go back to the yeah 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 that's a good question so the total formula would still how does that sure. Um, from the slicer. Yeah, that's good. And actually, I'll, I'll leave that one in here. Um, let's add a slicer of maybe bikes. Do you want like that, or are you stuck with something totally different, like date? Um, yeah, bikes is fine. We can start with that. Yeah, so we'll apply that category filter. Add the slicer. So, really, when I select bikes, in my mind, what that's doing is it's taking the whole, the whole data set and just filtering down to that one product category, and then the relationships will traverse to the, the, the fact table. Really all I should see here is just this top section for bikes. And that is what I see. And also it, it shows <laughs> bikes total and grand total are still just the bikes because the bikes is now being applied as a filter to this. So now when I go to votes, it's gonna show the same thing, but just for votes. So the total would be affected because I see, starting off from the data set. Right, right, right. And I never, because I did two filters on it, I had two uh, filter modifications. First I did all on products, right? 
If I were to just leave it all on products, that would now that instead of nine five two nine, it would show that forty five thousand. But the other the other thing I did is apply the values of of a category, and that's actually what's what it's what it's doing. That's why it's coming up. So if I want, I could create another measure without yeah. the category thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can do that. And also, you could do. You know, I did. I used the values function because what I wanted to do was to say, hey, no matter where we are, no matter what category we live in, we want to apply that category as a filter, right? Um, and that would work the same as if I let's do both likes and votes. Notice the grand total here is two nine zero five two. It's again showing it for both likes and votes because when I'm here, the values presence, the values present for category are, are there's two values present, likes and votes. So that's what it's using as a filter. If I use a different one, like a year or something, which is not within this yeah. table, it would still behave normal. Year would behave exactly how you'd how you'd expect because it's not like it's interesting to see how things like slicers and row labels affect categories that you are also filtering on in DAX, but ones where they're not, you know. When you're when you're filtering on year or date or something like that, some other dimension that is not part of the DAX, it's going to act exactly how you expect. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's that's on our. Are, are there any questions about this first before I move on? Just a comment. Yes. Uh, you brought up an, uh, you brought up a good observation about asking about the power pivot window. Yeah. And you know a lot of people. Are, uh, developing in Power BI, yes. an advantage of Power Pivot in Excel is that you can manually filter the rows yeah. of whatever table when and then test measure. your measure to see is it what I expect. Yeah, you can. Um, I really want that to happen in Power BI. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> it would be great. Which is why, which is half the reason why I use um, Excel to, to develop. I mean, it's great because you can do things like, for example, this amount. If I filter this table to just a single customer, even these measures down here will change. So they can see the results of that right away. Again, just for development or troubleshooting. It's wow, so it shows each of the intermediate measures you can see, right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't, it's not always great. I mean, like, in um, analysis services tabular, it's a similar environment where you have the split screen, you have the measures on the bottom. But that one doesn't always work right. Like that one, it doesn't always show. Uh, and maybe I should say that's the version I'm on. They don't always play well with that second half of the grid. They just come back with blanks most of the time. But, but yeah, that's why you know that's why I find that Excel is one of the better development environments as long as you're not dealing with tons you know, and tons of data. Yeah. yeah. And if you're just doing data modeling, I mean, if you're once you once you get to applying security and that kind of thing, analysis services is the way to go. But um, yeah. So let me get to my PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> All right. That's on that one. Uh, I did that. Okay. So this next part is talking about when a row context is present. Uh, so have you guys heard about context transition? Has that been a anybody heard about that? You know? Cool. Context transition is uh, is something that DAX is trying to be smart about. And what it does is it says if there's a row context present, I'm going to take that row context and apply an equivalent filter context. I'm going to show you an example of what that means. But um, there are certain things that do this. Calculate and calculate table will, will do that. We'll take a row context if one exists, and we'll make an equivalent filter context. The other thing that we'll have we'll do this is just calling another measure. It's like there's an it's like the calculate's been wrapped around whatever measure you call, and it does this thing called context transition. I'll show you what that means. And then again, trying to do a really simple example, this one where we talk about cats and dogs and spiders and so on. Um, I already showed when we add the calculated column of just, hey, I want to equal the age column. That's, that's what we get, right? I also wanted to express, I wanted to show what, like an example of a DAX function that ignores row context. <coughs> the simplest one is sum. If I just say sum of that, you may or may not expect that this is going to happen. Just because it shows 12. It doesn't know that the row is there. It's just adding everything up in that column. Because sum ignores row context. It doesn't know that it exists as part of the table. Um, so that, like I said, that may or may not be expected, but you have to know that it's there because it can affect, it can affect what your, what your results are. Right? So what I was saying about context transition is that calculate will do a context transition. It will say, if I were to put calculate in front of this sum, it will say what? 
it will say, what is the current row, and how can I, how can I apply that as a filter instead? Notice, too, that actually adding a filter to calculate is optional, right? You don't actually have to add one. So I can just close this off right here and hit enter and go, and we can see what it does. But I want to first ask, if I were, right now, right here, I'm at, I'm at this point, so I'm this, the first row, right? If I were to ignore, even if I didn't ignore that, um, how could I filter this table? What would be the equivalent filter for this table to get to, um, to get to, to cat and three, to get to that first row? You can't use the name of the pet. Yeah, you can't use the name of the pet. The row number? And you can't use the, yeah, row number would be great, but the row number is not available to us as a, I mean, if we added row number, then yes, we could, but we don't have that, right? You can't use the pet, and you can't use the age, and you can't use the combination of those two, this is a duplicate record, right? This doesn't seem like it would happen that often, which it doesn't, but it does happen sometimes. Um, so you have to be aware of this. So if I hit enter on this, what actually happens is that it does this correctly for dog and spider, but for cat, it doesn't. Because it's trying to create an equivalence, you know, to say the row context is cat and three. So I'm gonna make that a filter, cat and three. But when you put cat and three as a filter on the sum of the age, what well, you get is six, because there's two rows that are cat and three. So then, yeah, so don't they have a equivalent current row? No. An implied row thing? No, they don't. Like, that seems like a bug. It does. It seems weird, right? I don't like it. It actually took me years and years to figure out what the hell was going on. Like, but when, when, yes, you're missing the primary key. Yes, no, totally. Part of this is a data modeling issue, or part of this is a data source issue. I agree. Um, some of that, and this is really easy to see here, and this is why I created this very simple example. It gets a little bit harder when you're creating a DAX measure that implies um, we can create a DAX measure with something like sum x. Sum x is a function that actually creates a creates a table in memory. Since we can't see that table, we don't actually know what the we, we don't know what the rows are, but we can only imagine what the rows are, right? Um, sum x will create that table in memory, and if you have these duplicate things come up, you'll run into this problem and it will be very strange. <laughs> like something will feel off. And it's not in the sense of there's sometimes when things are off when you're developing in here that you really know because it's like, oh, it's the same number for every row. There's something wrong. I need to fix something. But then there's sometimes when something comes up where it's it's not it's not the same number for every row. It just feels a little bit off. And that's what's going on here. So, so you're saying, yeah, this does pop up when you do a sum. It creates a temp table. And sum x. That's yeah. uh, sum x. And it doesn't have a primary key. And it does pet and age. Yeah, that's a bug. It seems like it, it seems like it would be a bug. Off. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I have an example of this using that other model that will, that will give a little bit better business context in terms of like when you would actually see this. So, but I want to first show the behavior that when you're taking what context transition is, is it saying what is the filter? What would be an equivalent filter for this row? Cat and three, that would be an equivalent filter, and you can see how that kind of fails us in the case where you have duplicate records. So I'm going to go to that other the other Excel file, this one we were just playing with. And we're going to go to, first I'm going to look at the data model. So I want to show you guys something about this. And again, part of this is data model design, but I don't want anyone to get hung up on that. <laughs> we have um, really the four columns in here, ignoring all the measures that are there. Our product ID, customer ID, date, and quantity, right? If I wanted to get the dollars associated with quantity. Uh, for whatever reason, the price is in the product table. So I need to multiply these two things together and then add up all the results. Um, that's not that weird, but it's, it is weird to have the price in that table. And one thing you could do is just bring the price into this table and then calculate the extended amount and then you'd be done, right? But let's say there's restrictions on it. Let's say this thing is 100 million records and you can't afford to add two, two more columns to that because it creates memory issues. Uh, just throwing it out. And that's unit price, right? Yeah, that's unit so, price. So it's logical it would be there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unit price could be a bit. I'm just saying for a lot of customers it could be different or for whatever reason the price may not make sense up there. Right. Usually yeah. it's recorded at the time of transaction. So that's why. It, 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 it could be here also. <coughs> right. It could because be Because yeah. you know, each customer has a different price. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so usually it like. It depends yeah, on company to company. company. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So it's let's fixed say, fixed let's say it was a, let's say it was a list price or something. Okay. Yeah. Instead of us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, list price is good. It lives in the product table at the product attribute. <laughs> And that kind of makes sense. So if we want to understand the extended amount for that list price, we need to multiply the quantity by that by that price there. So the measure that we come up with there is right here. 
And I already, it's already spoiler alert, this is the wrong one, but that's okay. Because this is probably the one you, you try to start out with. So you know that by, by calculating the quantity times the price, you know you have to do that by each product. You have to say, for this product, we sold 100 of them, and it was $10 a piece, so it's $1,000. Then I go to the next product, and then I would add all the results of that up. That's what we have to do. So that's exactly what this formula is saying. We're taking the sum x, right? The product table, meaning we're going to go through the product table one by one, and we're going to grab the sum of the quantity and multiply that by the price. You would think this would just, this would work, because <laughs> that's what you would kind of expect. Um, and what happens when you actually bring this in? First of all, does that make sense? The sum no. X? Okay, but it should have a related product, right? It should be for that product, right? right. Uh, it doesn't have to have related because what table are you in right now? They're in the products table. So in the product table, what knows the product price is, that's good. But then the fact, you don't know against which one, right? Uh, you mean which, which table? The quantity, the fact table, yeah. This guy is okay to have in there because it will, it's a normal filter context. It's not a row context, oh. yeah. But I know what you're saying because you're, we're talking about when you have, when you want a row context to traverse relationships, you have to explicitly say that. But really, some quantity is, is ignoring row context. It doesn't matter if it's there, so this is fine. This is an okay syntax, and it will work. It will calculate something, but what you'll see is it will calculate it incorrectly. Um, so we'll add that in. Amount wrong. And I'm going to get rid of the five that you just to keep this real simple. So this doesn't necessarily, like at first glance, without thinking about the numbers, you might be like, okay, it's done. I'm going to deploy it, and it'll be all done. But what you can see is that the total doesn't make sense, right? It says seven million, where the other three, I mean, it's adding up to maybe two. Three million, whatever it is, it's definitely not seven. So there's something wrong here, and you wouldn't necessarily expect there was something wrong with your DAX plot. You might go looking around trying to figure out how did this thing happen. If we take a look at one little correction that we have here, so this is the correct one. Yeah, all I did was add calculate around the sum of the sales plot. And what that did is it said that if there's a row context, now when I created the sum x and I said we're going to do this by product for the product table, that means every single row of the product table we're going to go through one by one and get this calculation. That creates a row context. And sum ignores row context. So it doesn't know that we're in the product table. It's just adding up everything with that price. So instead we say calculate and it says, okay, well, once we add calculate, we'll take a row context, text if it exists, which it does exist, it's a product table and apply that to the sum of quantity. Then it will multiply that by the price. So this is actually the, the correct way of doing it. And again, this is something that I struggled with for a long time. I've been doing this since 2010, since Carpet came out. Forever, I didn't understand what was going on. And what I ended up doing every time was creating an intermediate measure. I would create the quantity measure first, and then I would just say, instead of calculating the sum of quantity, I would just say quantity, just the quantity measure. The reason why I did that is because I didn't know when you call another measure, it does this row context, or it does the context transition thing automatically. <coughs> I just didn't know what was happening. It just worked every time. So your calculate is only around that sum measure? Yeah, it's only around there. There's no filters applied to it. All it's doing is forcing a context transition to happen because there's a row that exists in the products table that we want to, we want to apply whatever context we're in that row. We want to apply that as a filter to our quantity. So why do we need a sum? What do we need somewhere? Oh, on the products? This part? Um, sum of sales quantity. Yeah, that's the sum of the sales quantity, right? Because you can imagine where we're living right now is on the products table. Okay. Yeah? So if we're in the, and actually we can, I'll go through that really quick. Let's take a look at that product table. So it might make more sense once we, actually I can probably illustrate how this is doing this too. So here we are in the products table. And I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. This is good because I think we'll help clarify. Can you put the correct? Well, before you do that, yeah. show me the correct. Oh yeah, yeah, you want to see it. Column, you want to see the right one. one? I want to see the right one. All right, that's that's And then fair. you can go forward. There you go. That's what that right one's doing. And, and actually, these three add up to that, and it's the it's the accurate calculation of extended list price. And and that's because when you put in the calculate, yes. it reset the value in the row? It, it basically said, oh, we are on the, 
we're at the single row of the product table. We need to filter our quantity down right. to, yeah, yeah. That's it cleared it and started prep. It reset yeah. it, it cleared it and started prep for yes. each row. Yes, for each row. Otherwise, yes. it like uh, keeps counting what it did previously, it remembers yeah. what it did, and keeps counting, counting, counting. And yes. it's actually double counting or triple counting. Or yeah, depending <laughs> on which one. <laughs> Accumulating the count. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's doing something really strange. Because like I said, sometimes you know that something's wrong just because it's the same number listed every time. And that's like, oh, that's really easy. And, and, this is also weird. and so basically the purpose of what you're pointing out, just because I so I understand, because I have never heard of road transition before, is that you have to be aware of this because unless you understand what DAX is doing, it's going to double count and accumulate. Yeah. Whereas in other programming line programming, it will clear yes. and start again. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we have to be aware. It clears cash or it clears yeah. something. It's temporary, whatever, and but in this it doesn't, so you have to remember that. Yeah, is that point? Yes, yeah, yeah. and that's um, and yeah. the idea behind that is that. Um, well, let me let me go to the table. We'll we'll see okay. we'll see sorry, how this is working. Her, uh, oh yes, I wanted to see correct. Okay, I'm going to go to that table. We're going to see exactly what happens when I create a sum at the end of this table. I haven't done this in any of these demos, but we'll see what this does. So this is the product table, and when we did our sum x, we said, hey, look at this product table row by row, and find the sum of the quantity. That's what we did first. We just said sum of the quantity, and, and we turned out, it turned out that it was calculating wrong. And hopefully when we do it this way, we'll see why it's calculating wrong. Um, okay. Well, there you go, that's why it's wrong. So what it does at that point, so we're, thinking, we're bringing apart that DAX function that says sum x products, pick <laughs> sum quantity multiplied by the price. So the next thing we did was multiply by the price. So if I do this times this, I get this. I'm going to add all that all up together. I get that seven million that was living on that other sheet. So this is incorrect because this column right here is grabbing the quantity for everything. The reason why I look different by category is because it multiplied by prices, and that's where you kind of where it kind of looks fuzzy. It's not the same number for every row, which is what's going on here. It really, is a red flag that there's something wrong. But it's, the, it's showing these different things because it's running this calculation against price. So by adding the calculate, and in this table, when you put calculate, when you wrap calculate around this, it's saying, okay, in this row, what's, how can we filter this to show that this is the row we're on? Well, this one has a primary key, so it knows it can filter correctly. It will filter on that product. And again, that's all row context and filter? Yeah, yeah. Row, it's, the row to, to filter context is called context transition. That's what, that's what the term that the... Uh, the Italians the gave Italians. it, I'm, I'm going to stick with it. That's a good one, I don't want to rename it. But yeah, so when I wrap calculator around there, now knows. <coughs> when I grab a sum of quantity, I only want to grab it with the product zero. And then when I multiply that by our, by our um, price, I get this. And now when I sum it all up, it all looks good. So, question. Yeah. So is it always a good practice to use calculate with sum? Yeah. Um, it's not a bad one. I don't think it's a bad one at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, is a good one? <laughs> I was, I'm just saying it most, most of the time it may be unnecessary because if there is no real context, that won't do anything. No, I have a funny answer. But it won't if hurt. something doesn't work, I don't know measure, I put a calculation. <laughs> oh, no, well, that's what I was doing for a long time. If something wasn't working, I would just make it an intermediate measure and I would call on it. But really, what we're both doing is, is discovering that there's something happening and we're correcting it with context transition. We just didn't know that's what we were doing. But yeah, that's, that's right. So, wrapping calculator around some is not going to hurt anything. So, sure. <laughs> you can do that. It takes well. It, it takes the if there is a row context, it will take that row context and apply it as a filter. Right. Yeah, that's why it's doing that. But um, yeah, I was gonna say. I'm just thinking about what he said. Like oh, what he said. Wrapping calculator on every time. If there's a row context, it will apply it as a filter. And if you don't want it to do that for some reason, then it could create unwanted overhead. Uh, especially if you had nested calculates. And nested row context that can create a lot of headache that you wouldn't necessarily. Do. That's going to be a little bit more complex than the DAX. I, I don't think um, I don't think you'd run into that every day, but I do know I have run into an example of nested calculates creating a lot of overhead um, because of context transition where it wasn't necessary. No, no, sir. Oh, I'm going to get his first. I'll get yours. How precisely did it know to use product and um, whatever that product code as the uh, 
So how does this know? Yeah, I, I'm not using the word filter generally. No, no, that, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, uh, I believe that's kind of just a, a um, it's just an attribute of the data model. Like it's something it that, that the Microsoft people is, built in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a primary key. It knows it's a primary key because it's it's a it's a part of a relationship. That's why it knows. Because okay. this is the this is the one part of the one to many relationship. So it knows that this is unique. It has to be in order to create a relationship. Mm -hmm. But if it was something else though, like if it, if you didn't know or if the model didn't know because you created a relationship on it, you can actually tell it in the advanced area here. You can tell it which key or which field is, is, is a unique identifier. I'm trying to figure out where that is. Oh, that's okay. No, but it's something you can force. It doesn't, just the part there. <laughs> it does if you create a relationship on it. Yeah. It doesn't know. If you, if you have no relationship on it and there is a column that would, that would act as a primary key, um, it may know, but if it doesn't, that will create a lot of overhead because instead of saying, I'm going to look at this one column, it's going to look at every row and look for duplicates across the row. So if there's a way to explicitly say that this column is your primary, is your unique identifier, then you should do it. I think um, it's in the model, right? Is it in the model? I think. Should be in the I think it's oh design. Uh, and really, I, I know where it is in the um, analysis services one because that's yeah. really the spot I really do it. But um, I don't see it in here. Table behavior. Here. here it is. It's here. Row identifier. Product ID. Now it already knows a product ID is a row identifier because it's a part of a relationship. But that's how you do it if there was no relationship present. You'd force it to be that. That way, whenever you have to do something row by row, instead of it looking at every column in the row, it will just look at one. That could help with overhead. Yeah. So that was that part. It's okay. Do you have a question? It's okay. You can laugh at me. No, I just. <laughs> It's okay. I'm not laughing at you, it's just kind of. With me, you're laughing with like, me. We're laughing at you. my mouth shut. No, it's okay. No, you don't have to keep your mouth shut. I said I wanted to be informal. That's fine. All right, so another tip that I have. This is really near the end of our thing, anyway. How long is this supposed to go? Am I, am I done? Five minutes. Oh, okay. All right, we're good. The last tip I have for you is think of filters as columns. And the reason why I have that as a tip is because it's not every time that in your filter. I'm going to go back to the cat back here. It's our most common tab for that one. This is what people normally see as a filter. They think of it as a Boolean. And this really is a Boolean. They're saying, well, product category is twice. That's it. But really, um, if you instead think of this as, instead of thinking of this as, as a test, think of it as the list of product, the list of, of things in the category table with this filter applied. Which is kind of a strange way of thinking about it, but that's really more how DAX behaves, is it's really just saying, what, what are you feeding me? Are you feeding me a table or are you feeding me a column? And what values are in that? And then it will apply each one of those things as a filter to it. And the example, a good example of that is what we did Back here when we did um, the horrible, what was the name of that thing? Bikes test. <laughs> we did. Oh, I hit it. That's right. I hit it. In the data. <laughs> Someone happy to hide it. <laughs> it's been hidden. It's okay. Unhide. All right, now I'm going back to this and I'm going to look at the bike quantity test. And you can see that there's actually no Boolean tests listed here. It's taking the products table. So however many columns are in the products table? Four, right? And it's saying, release all filters from that. That's the first thing it's doing. And then saying, okay, that's now, that's now un undated any filters on that. Then it says, grab the values that are in the product category. That's not the test either. That's not Boolean at all. It's just saying, what is my Why don't I have equal to bytes or any, any sort of equal sign here? It's because a Boolean test is not necessary. It's really just saying, this is, this is what I want. Everything in this table or everything in this column. And, and it's really only one of those two. Any, uh, any, more, any more questions? We don't have much time. No more time. 
is there a way you just have, you just mentioned that the filter either applies to the entire table or to a column? Yeah. Is there a way at all to use a measure as a filter? Yes. Oh. Yes, you can. But you have to give it some sort of context. So um, you can't use a measure, not without some extra development, you really can't use a measure in terms of like a slicer. Not right now, they're working on it right now. But you can't like bring over this measure as a slicer and then be able to slice some of those values. But what you could do is you can say, let's say I'm interested in everything that 